What's up guys, welcome back to another DBR Snapshot. Today we're finishing the book of Numbers and we find some interesting things here right at the end. We've been getting mostly narrative in this book, except for the first, I guess, first couple of chapters where we see the numbers of the people in Israel. We've gotten mostly the story of them in the wilderness. Over the course of 40 years, we have a lot of information, but now we come to the end and what the focus now is is the land that they're about to go into so chapter 34 is all about the borders of the land talks about um, the northern border the southern border the eastern border the western border um, which a lot of those are easy to figure out when you look at a map so if you got a study bible this would be a great day for you to check that out and look at the maps that are included here for chapter 34 chapter 35 talks about the cities that the levites were supposed to live in um, because if you remember the levites don't have an inheritance of land if you remember what what god said earlier was my, your inheritance to the Levites, your inheritance is the priesthood, is, is me, God actually said. I am your inheritance. So they didn't have a land, but they had this relationship with God that was special and a special role in God's uh, earthly kingdom here. So that's what the Levites were supposed to do. But then we find something very interesting in Numbers 35 about cities of refuge. And a lot of people are confused by this. And if you read it really quickly, what you might think is God has a place for people to get out of their crimes. Um, but that's not really what happens. Uh, the cities of refuge are places where people would go when someone would accidentally kill somebody. So if you remember from the beginning of the law, Exodus 20, it's very clear that if you murder somebody, then you're you're in trouble with God. He's not going to let you go to this city of refuge if you intentionally murdered somebody. This is for the person who accidentally hurt somebody and they have family members that are going to come try to take them out. There, This is a place for them to be safe and you can't go and attack somebody in this city. But you have to know the parameters for this was it was an unintentional killing. Um, so manslaughter is the word that's used if the manslayer goes into the boundary of the city not the murderer there's a difference uh, a manslayer is someone who accidentally kills somebody a murderer is somebody who chooses selects says i'm going to go take that person out and then they go kill that person that's much different and those people as the law says deserve to be put to death that's what happened in israel so that's just to clear up any confusion on the cities of refuge for you also the last chapter in the book of numbers is all about it it says the marriage of female heirs and if you remember there was that story where these daughters of a guy went and asked moses hey can we have the inheritance from our father because our father didn't have any sons can we get the inheritance and the idea was yes they could but the problem was now it's time for them to grow up and get married and some of them want to get married maybe to people outside of the tribe. But the tribal leaders say, wait a minute. So if we're going to go into the land and each tribe is going to get a, an allotment of land, if the daughters from these tribes, when there's no brothers, no inheritance goes to anybody in the family except for the daughters, if they marry somebody, let's say they're from the tribe of Judah, and they marry someone from the tribe of Ephraim, if that happened, then what would happen to that land? It would transfer from the tribe of Judah to the tribe of Ephraim. And the leaders in Judah don't want that to happen. So with these daughters, the daughters of uh, Zelophehad, um, they have to marry within their own tribe. And that's the idea. So that's how the book ends. And I think it ends with this for a reason because it's showing they're about to go into the land. They're about to step foot into the promised land. And we're gonna find out more about what the preparation they have um, for that in the book of Deuteronomy, which we'll look at tomorrow. But let's look at the book of Mark. We're still in Mark, Mark chapter 10, right in the middle of this chapter. Uh, we see Jesus doing some interesting things. First of all, his main focus now is the disciples. He is telling the truth to them. He's very being very forthcoming, very honest with them about what's about to happen. He says that he's going to die. He says he's going to rise again. And for some of them, I don't even think they really got that until after it happened. They thought that might have just been a parable or some saying that he gave just like a lot of his sayings that weren't to be taken literally they were meant to be taken figuratively i'm thinking that many of them thought this was a figurative thing because when he died and even before he rose again some people and after he rose again some people didn't even believe him so uh that happens here also james and john make a request of jesus that they should not have um, really it says james and john went up and asked jesus and some of the other gospels explain that the mom was involved here too their mom went and asked jesus hey can we sit at your right and left hand can james and john be the two most important people in the kingdom of god and jesus says look i'm not giving that spot those spots out right now but just so you know leadership in the church and in the kingdom looks a little bit different if you look at verse 
42, Jesus called all the disciples together and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. So they have their power and they exercise their power and authority over people and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. So when it comes to Christian leadership, that's not what leadership is. It's not taking your authority and making everybody do stuff for you. That's not the point. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. So if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you know what that means? That means that you're a great servant. Why? Well, because, verse 44, and whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That was the mission of Jesus, to come and serve his people. So if we want to be great in Jesus' kingdom, we need to be like Jesus and serve other people. And I want you to think, how can you do that? All right? In the very next verses, we see how Jesus continues to do that and heals this blind guy named Bartimaeus, who is in a helpless situation. He can't see anything. Jesus, what does he do? He goes in and he serves and he helps. And I think this is a great reflection of the truth he just taught. But I want you to figure that out. How can you serve people? Who can you serve? Who in your family can you serve? Who at your school can you serve? How can you serve people today and give your life? Maybe not in a in a salvific sense, right? You can't give your life to save anybody. But what you can do is spend your life helping people. How can you help God's people today? That's a good question for you to think over and for you to apply as we walk away from this DBR snapshot. I hope you're challenged to be like Jesus and to give your life away just like he did. So we'll see you back tomorrow for another Daily Bible Reading Snapshot.